I think we are ready to go. And Charlotte, your grandma's from Bermuda and she's deathly afraid of cockroaches. I completely get that. Um, I am too, but I think these are Anna's favorite animals, which she just said before. So I'm sure there's nothing to be worried about. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anna and we're going to learn all about kissing Madagascar cockroaches. And yes, this is happening right now. I've been so excited. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for joining us here again today. Um, I recognize some names in the chat from our earlier programs from Frostology and from Kaboomistry, um, which happened last week. Um, so we're still going to provide programming for um, Connected North at home for the next few weeks. We've got a lot of really fun stuff planned. Um, if you guys would like to ask or answer questions, I have a lot of questions that I'm going to ask you, but if you also have questions that you'd like to ask me, um, make sure that you are using the chat feature. Um, since I can't see or hear you, the chat is the only way for you to communicate with me. I know that um, Katie and Molly are both going to um, take a look at the chat. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, and then we'll save some time at the end to make sure we have lots of time to answer questions. But we'll have some, some other times in the middle too where we can ask and answer some questions through that same chat feature. Um, so today we are going to be learning about um, my Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And uh, Molly or Katie, could someone um, make me, I don't know if it's the host or the panelist or whatever it might be, but so that I can share my screen. Um, so I'm gonna wait for them to turn up. There we go, perfect. So now I'm the presenter, so I can share my slides with you. Um, so I am, my name is Anna, um, and this is where I work. So if we haven't met yet, I work at a place called the Michigan Science Center. And if you are familiar with the United States, um, Michigan is just south of Ontario. Um, and this is a map of Michigan here. So um, this purple outline, that is the state of Michigan. That's where I live and that's where I work. Um, and this building right here, this is a picture of the Michigan Science Center or a part of our building. Um, that is our planetarium. Um, so I usually work in a city called Detroit, um, but since Michigan is on lockdown, just like Ontario is, or at least parts of Ontario I know, um, I am now working from home. And so I have my very special hissing cockroach roommates that actually came home from the Science Center with me. And so we're actually gonna talk about them today. Now, normally, um, when we run this program, I don't always tell people what animal we're going to meet. And so I have some slides that give people hints. And so we're still gonna work through those hints and we're just gonna talk about them a little bit more broadly since we know what the animal is, um, but we're still gonna talk about some of these hints and some of these facts. So these cockroaches are not the same kind of cockroaches that are native to North America. Um, they're not native to Canada, they're not native to the States. Um, so you wouldn't find this exact species of cockroach ever crawling around outside. And you'll notice some big differences between these cockroaches and some of the cockroaches that you might have seen before. Um, so let's see. The first hint that I normally give people is that this cockroach or that this animal is native to this um, red island. So it's not actually red, but on um, this island, that's off the coast of Africa. It is called Madagascar. So if you've ever heard of the movie Madagascar, that is where all of those animals are um, visiting in that movie. The next hint I'll give you is that um, these animals are cold blooded. Now, tell me in the chat, are humans cold blooded? Yes or no? Are humans cold blooded? I'm seeing some very great answers. Um, so no, people are not cold blooded. We are warm blooded creatures. Um, so what you can do to prove that to yourself is if you take your hands, if you're not busy using the chat feature and you just place them on the sides of your neck. Um, so go ahead and touch the sides of your neck and you'll feel that your neck is very, very warm. Um, that's because humans actually create our own body heat. What it means to be cold blooded is that they don't have that ability. Um, they're not able to make their own body heat to keep themselves warm. Um, so instead they have to share the heat with their environment. Um, so you'll see that in this picture, this is a gecko. 
um, an albino le leopard gecko that's been taken a photo of with an infrared camera. And infrared actually measures heat signatures. And so if you look at this little thermometer here, you'll see that um, really cold temperatures are down here in the dark blue or purple range. And then the warmer it gets, the lighter the color becomes. So it kind of in the middle is this pink and then orange. And all the way up at the top, we've got this white. And so the human in this picture, right, is very, very warm. If you use the, the scale or the thermometer, right, um, humans are very warm. We create our own body heat, but this lizard is relatively cool. Um, they're kind of down here in this dark purple range. And so that lizard is actually sharing body heat with the human right now. Um, out in nature, right, cold-blooded animals get their heat from the environment. So they'll get it from the sun or from the rocks that they bask on because they're not able to make their own body heat. Um, the next clue or hint that um, I give people when we talk about these cockroaches is that they have an exoskeleton. Um, so it, there's a word up here, it says that it's an exoskeleton, meaning that its skeleton is external. Um, external means outside. Um, so do humans have an exoskeleton? Another question you can answer in the chat. Do humans have an exoskeleton, yes or no? You guys are very, very smart. So you probably know that if you look at a human, right, our skeleton is inside our body. Um, so our skeleton is inside our body. It's there to protect all of our inner organs. It's also there to give us um, range of motion so that we're able to move our um, body using our muscles in combination with our bones. Um, but Cockroaches and these animals in this picture all have a skeleton outside their body. So things like shellfish, like crabs and shrimp, um, or tarantulas and beetles, um, their skeleton is outside of their body. Um, it's kind of like a hard protective shell or like a case um, to keep all of their insides safe. Uh, the last hint that I normally give people before we reveal what this animal is is that this animal is able to hiss. Now, if we were guessing, right, we know that it couldn't be a cat because cats are mammals. They have fur. Um, they're warm-blooded, just like our people are. Um, so if we were going through these hints, right, we would know that it can't be a cat, but that this animal is able to hiss. Do you guys know any other animals that are able to hiss um, that is not a cat and is not a cockroach? about all the animals you know. What kind of animal can hiss? Yeah, I'm seeing it, a snake, right? So snakes are able to hiss um, just like cockroaches and just like uh, cats, but they all use a different process in order to um, make that noise. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so hissing is kind of a unique feature and only animals or only certain animals can do it. Um, especially outside the mammal family, um, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And so the animal that we are talking about today is our Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Um, and so these have a really, really scientific name or scientific way to classify them, um, but their names are kind of difficult. So uh, if we think about this in terms of how we break down the animal kingdom, we break things down into categories. Um, the larger category, the largest category we'll talk about for this cockroach is that it's part of the phylum arthropoda. Um, so it's also what we know as an arthropod. Um, do you know any other kinds of arthropods? Name me another kind of arthropod that you might know if you're familiar with them. If not, that's okay in the chat. Um, so besides a cockroach, do you know any other arthropods? A daddy long legs is an arthropod. A centipede is an arthropod. Yeah, so spiders, other kinds of bugs. Great answers, you guys. Now, um, if we think about some of these answers, um, then we can get to our next classification, which is talking about the class. Um, so this is part of the class Insecta. Um, now, if we think about some of the animals that we've named, so things like spiders or things like centipedes, 
those are not insects. They are arthropods, but they are not insects. Um, so a Madagascar hissing cockroach is an insect. And then very lastly, the most specific way that we can classify these animals um, is by its species name. You always write them in italics, so these letters are kind of slanted. Um, you always write species names in italic, um, and you can repeat this one after me from home. It is a mouthful, but get ready to repeat after me. Say, Gromphodorina portentosa. Yes, good job. So um, it's a very, very long word, so we don't use it very often. That's why we give animals common names as well. So the common name is the Madagascar hissing cockroach, um, but if we wanted to be specific, we would have to call it the Gromphodorina portentosa. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll stop our share here and we'll get to take a look at our cockroaches. Now, these cockroaches are nocturnal. Um, so tell me in the chat, uh, what does it mean to be nocturnal? Yeah, yeah, we're getting we're hitting all of the features here. So normally nocturnal animals animals are asleep during the day. Normally, not always, um, but they are normally asleep during the day. Um, they are usually awake at night, and most specifically, while they're awake at night, that's while they that's where they do all of their um, hunting and eating. Um, and so they're most active at night. Um, so to do those things that all animals need to do to survive, right? Um, all animals need to eat, all animals need to reproduce. Um, and so nocturnal animals do most of those pro processes at night. Um, and I see that Gina said like a bat, bats are also nocturnal. So if we think about when we do see bats outside, we normally see them at nighttime. So that's actually why I've covered up our cage here with a blanket um, to see if we can get them to be just a little bit more active. Um, but since they are cold-blooded animals, um, they're pretty lazy. So um, since they don't make a lot of their own body heat, unless they are doing one of those active processes, unless they are out hunting or eating um, or finding a mate, um, cold-blooded animals are pretty lazy. And so they don't move around a whole lot. Um, so I do have some of them in the container. And you'll see that they're kind of gathered up. They really, really like this um, kind of eggshell here. Um, but this program wouldn't be any fun if we just left them in the container all day to be nice and lazy. Um, so before this program, I actually pulled a couple of them out and put them in a smaller container so we could take a closer look. Um, so the next question I have for you is we said that these animals are part of the insect family. So they're part of, they are insects. So before I show you one up close, go ahead and tell me how many legs does a true insect have? Yeah, six, which is awesome because they've been, they've done a couple of sessions. On insects, awesome. Yeah, you have all given me great answers. So true insects have six legs. Let me see if I, I'm actually not sure if I'm able to switch my camera. Let's see if it lets me. Uh, when you um, when you activated your document camera, you need to reset your um, microphone so you can just go up to communicate and activate your audio, please. All right, are you able to hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, perfect. So did you miss the last thing I said? Yeah, we did. Okay, that's okay. Sorry about that. So we can see that you guys were correct um, that insects like these cockroaches have six total legs. So 
we've got one, two, three on this side and three on the other. So um, a total of six legs. Um, now they also have antennas. And so these are um, two front appendages. Those are antennas, they are not legs. And that has a lot to do um, with body segments and how we label body segments um, in animals. And so I actually have a diagram of that as well. Um, so you already told me that, oops, oh, crazy, that they have six legs, which was our answer right there in the middle. Um, so we've got a diagram that shows the difference between a human, an insect, and an arachnid. Um, now we said that arachnids, things like spiders or tarantulas, um, even ticks are also arachnids. Um, scorpions are also arachnids, um, but they are not insects. And there are two main differences between arachnids and insects. Um, number one, you already told me, is the number of legs. So we know that insects have six legs, whereas arachnids have eight legs. Um, so spiders, tarantulas, they have eight legs. And you might be saying, uh, well, look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, but these top two appendages in this arachnid, those are just like the antennas in the cockroach. Um, these are sensory organs that we call pedipalps, um, and those are not true legs. Um, the other big difference between insects and arachnids are their body segments. So we have a human over here just for comparison, so we understand these body segments a little bit better. Um, but insects have three body segments. They have a head, they've got a thorax, which in a human we might call your chest, um, so where your respiratory organs are. Um, and the heart. Um, so there in an insect, um, the thorax is where we find all of the legs. And so anything that's not attached to the thorax, those are not true legs. All the legs have to be attached to this middle body segment that we call the thorax. Um, and then they have a lower body segment that we call the abdomen. Um, so in arachnids like tarantulas, we only have two body segments. And so instead of having a head and a thorax, they have a combined segment. So these two segments are combined into what we call the cephalothorax. Um, cephalo means brain, um, which you would normally find in the head. And then thorax is the same. It's kind of that chest region where all of the legs are attached. Um, but then arachnids also have an abdomen section. So um, three body segments in insects, two body segments in arachnids. Now I actually have two hissing cockroaches um, out to show you. So I'm going to grab the other one so that we just can... before you do, uh, Declan, Myla, and Jamie, they're very concerned. They're worried that the cockroach is going to bite you. They wonder if it, if it bites. You know, that's a great question. That's actually my favorite question that I get to answer about any live animal that we ever do a program with um, is, you know, do they bite? Um, I think the better question is, will they bite? Um, because anything that has a mouth um, or teeth, right, is able to bite. Um, so humans are able to bite, right? So if I was really mad um, or someone threatened me, right, I could bite them, but I'm probably not going to, right? So unless I have a reason, I'm not going to bite someone. So um, these cockroaches, could they bite? Yes, um, they do have a mouth, they do have teeth, um, but they know that I'm not a threat. I'm not trying to harm them. Um, so they're not going to bite me. Um, and their mouths are so small. So I see a question that says, how hard does it bite? Um, if they ever have bitten me, I probably didn't even notice because their mouths are so small and the skin on your hands is probably too thick for them to be able to penetrate with their tiny little um, mouths. And so um, if they ever have bitten me, I don't know about it. And so that's a great question. So um, you should always have a healthy respect for any live animal, right? They are living things and anything that feels like it needs to protect itself could bite. Um, but most animals that people use for programs like this, right, they're not going to bite because um, this is kind of enrichment for them. Um, they don't feel threatened. And as long as they feel nice and safe, they don't bite. Anna, would this be a good time for a couple of questions? Because I, I can see that the students have like, so many if we took maybe three or four right now yeah 
yeah. So there might be a couple things that um, I might say we're going to skip just in case I have a plan to talk about it. But yeah, let's take a couple questions. Okay, so Ava wants to know what are the things crawling on it? That's a great question. That's actually, so we can talk about that one right now um, before we get to my next segment. So there are tiny little things crawling all over this bug. Um, they're kind of difficult to see. The more still I hold, the more you might be able to see them as they kind of um, come around. I don't see any right now, but there are small little organisms that we call mites. Um, so we get mites in our homes, uh, not necessarily a bad thing. So we do have things like dust mites. There are actually tiny, tiny microscopic mites all over your eyelashes um, at any moment. Um, and these cockroaches have mites on them as well. So there's one right there on the back of its head. Um, and so these mites have a symbiotic relationship with cockroaches. I'll type that word in the chat, symbiotic. Um, do you know what a symbiotic relationship is? Um, if you do know, go ahead and tell me in the chat, what is a symbiotic relationship between two animals? I think that some of the students in the shark session might remember that. Yeah, if you don't remember, that's okay. Session. And the zoo. need a moment to yeah, if you need a moment to think about it, think about it. Tell me Brody in the chat. Has Brody has it and Gibbler, it is where they benefit from each other. Different species yeah. friends when two animals help each other from the beaten family. Yeah, exactly. So these animals um, are, I don't know if I would call it friends, but they both benefit from their relationship. So they both get something out of this relationship that helps them. Um, so the mites are actually eating um, small pieces of the exoskeleton that are beginning to decay, um, or they eat any sort of mold or mildew that might be growing on the cockroach. So cockroaches, these ones specifically, live in really warm climates. Um, they really like it when it's warm, which helps um, mold or things like that grow. And so the mites will actually eat that mold because it's good food for them. Um, and then the cockroaches, right, they stay nice and clean. And so it helps the mites because they get food, and it helps the cockroaches because they stay nice and clean thanks to those um, little mites. So if you've ever seen the pictures of the birds that ride around, uh, around on the rhinoceros um, in Africa, so if you've ever seen that picture, that's a symbiotic relationship as well. So um, that's the same thing. Those birds will actually eat things off the rhinoceros um, and the rhinoceros stays nice and clean. And so that's a symbiotic relationship as well. So I yes, that was a great question and good observations because I can't really see that. Um, There's one right there between his antennas. I'm not sure if you can see it. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I see it. Um, okay. Um, uh, uh, one question that sort of ties together is: Were cockroaches around around the dinosaur time, and how long can cockroaches live? So this exact species of cockroach was probably not around at the same time as the dinosaurs, but they probably have a distant relative that was. Um, arthropods mainly descend from ocean animals, and so ocean animals are much older than dinosaurs. There's been life in the ocean before there was ever life on um, above the water on Earth, and so um, these have an ancient ancestor in um, horseshoe crabs, and so horseshoe crabs are actually much older than dinosaurs, at least the first variation of them. So this species has not been around for you know millions of years, but it has been around for a very long time, or at least some sort of ancestor of this cockroach. Cool. Um, that is so. These are such fascinating creatures. Um, and I'm just going to look for one more question. How many hours? Um, How many hours does a cockroach sleep from LES? Oh, great question. So we said that these cockroaches are cold-blooded and so they are pretty lazy, um, but they're not always sleeping. They're kind of in this state of they're awake, right? Because cockroaches need to be constantly alert for predators out in the wild. And so they don't do a lot of sleeping like humans do. So where they're in a deep sleep where they can't be awoken or where they're dreaming, um, but they do spend a lot of their time inactive. So they're saving their energy from their food. Um, and so they're pretty lazy, I would say, for most hours of the day. I'd say that at most, they probably do about three or four hours of activity, and most of that is eating. 
Okay, and sort of to go with that, like um, Brody would like to know, and Gina would like to know, how is their eyesight and how is their hearing? How do they find food? And that'll be our last question before we before you go on. Hey, great question. So um, talking about cockroach senses. So they do have eyes. They're not very easy to see. So you probably can't see their eyes. Um, and that's because they're small and their eyes actually aren't very good. Um, so they do have eyes. They are able to see, um, but they mainly rely on those antennas as their main sensory organ. So um, humans have eyes and we rely pretty heavily on our eyesight. Um, but these cockroaches actually um, get a lot more information through their antennas. And so they feel vibrations really, really well. So as opposed to hearing um, or seeing, they're actually just sensing for changes in the environment around them. And so they're constantly um, sensing for movement that they can feel, um, those vibrations that they can feel if there's movement around them. Um, and they do see you know, motion off in the distance. So if something is moving really quickly, um, they might know that that's a predator and that they might need to either burrow or um, run away, um, but they're also not very fast. Um, all right, so um, I do have, I'm going to pull out my other cockroach here so we can take a closer look at both of them together. And I want you to look um, mainly for the difference between these two cockroaches. Um, there are a couple big differences between them. Um, so tell me in the chat, what is different about these two cockroaches? And I'll try to I'll try to keep them together. I have to do some corralling, cockroach wrangling, if you will. I mean, what is the difference between these two? Yeah, I'm seeing um, there's a big difference in color. Um, so this this one right here, this one that I just pulled out, he's a little bit more brown, whereas the other one that I had out originally is a little bit darker, um, almost kind of a almost black kind of color. So they're pretty different in color. Um, there's a difference in size. So the first one I pulled out is a little bit smaller. Um, and this one that I pulled out um, just now, that one is a little bit bigger. Um, one is a male and one is a female. And so um, we'll call them, or let's try to label them using, um, so do you think the big one is the male or the small one is the male? Go ahead and tell me in the chat, is the big one the male? I know it might be kind of hard to tell because now they're playing, now they're having a wrestling match. Um, tell me, is the big one the male or is the small one the male? I see that the small one's the male, a couple people are telling me, a couple people, yeah, most people. So I'm seeing a couple people saying the small one's the male, a couple people telling me the small one's the female. Um, now, cockroaches, unlike humans, there's not a big difference in size um, because due to the sex of the cockroach. And so um, males and females grow almost to the exact same size. Um, just like in human genetics, we can all just look differently based on the traits that we've inherited from our parent organisms. And so the size really doesn't have a lot to do with which one is a male and which one is a female. And the color actually doesn't either. So just like people, um, can have different hair colors or different skin tones. Um, that's all just based on genes that you inherit from your parents or from your relatives. Um, so the color and the size actually have nothing to do with how we would figure out the gender of these two cockroaches. Um, do you know how we might tell the difference between these two cockroaches, um, between which one is the male and which one is the female? So besides the color and besides the size, is there something else that you know we use to determine the sex of the cockroaches? They are comfy on each other, just like that. Yeah, so I see Ava says um, something if you look kind of at that abdomen region. So that's one way that we can tell. Um, I did get a question. They do lay eggs. Um, we'll talk about that in um, just a moment here once we determine which one is the female. Um, so yeah, looking at the belly or the underside, um, that's actually um, the best way. So, all right, so I have a diagram. So before we um, come back to these cockroaches, I'm going to show you um, one more picture. Or two more pictures, really. Um, and so there are two ways to determine the sex of a, a Madagascar hissing cockroach. Um, the first way um, is probably the easiest way, especially if you're uncomfortable with the cockroaches, um, that you could tell from the top side. Um, so males 
have these horns on their head. So if we look at the head of the cockroach, males have these big horns or these big bumps on their head. Uh, males have those so that they can dig um, and also so that they can fight other male cockroaches when they are looking for a mate. Um, since females don't need to fight other females, um, since the males do that for them and they don't do as much digging, they don't have those bumps on their head. So um, they've got kind of really just small little kind of outlines of where the horns should be, um, but their heads are pretty flat. Um, so males have the horns and females do not, but you can't always tell based on the horns when they're still young. Um, so they don't develop their horns fully until they are adults. Cockroaches, just like tarantulas or like most arthropods, actually do kind of shed their exoskeleton. We call it molting. And so these cockroaches do molt um, and they molt, I think it's seven times before they're a completely full grown adult. And until they're fully grown, they don't always have these horns. And so if we wanted to tell before they were fully grown or we wanted to make sure we're being extra sure which ones are males and which ones are females, we actually have to look at their underside. And so if you flip over the cockroach, um, and you look at their last body segment. Um, so if we look at the very end of the abdomen, on a male, they've got three small segments here. So one, two, three that they've outlined in this photo. Um, and so they actually have three small segments, whereas females actually just have one large segment. So you'll see that they don't have those same kind of divides. It's not split into three pieces. It's just one large segment. And that is because these female cockroaches do hold an egg sac. Um, so when they are carrying young or nymphs, we call them, when they're carrying those eggs, um, they need a lot more space inside for um, that egg sac to be held. And so they have this big fused segment um, and the egg sac inside them is called an oothica. Um, so the oothica is an egg sac. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So I'll um, take my slides down and let's double check on which one we said was the male and which one was the female because we had some conflicting results. So if you look at this one, we'll start with this one right here. And I turn it to the side. Tell me, this is the small one. Is this a male or a female? We're looking at the small one. Is it a male or a female? Yeah, you guys are right. So that one is the female. The small one is the female. And remember, it's not about how big she is, but her head is really, really flat. She doesn't have those horns. And so we know that one is a female. We'll set her down for just a moment. Um, and then we'll look at this one. So this one is the male. If we turn him to the side, and he's really, really active now. Um, if we turn him to the side, we can see that he does have horns. Um, he has those bumps on his head. Um, and we'll try to flip him over. So he's pretty active, but we'll flip him over. And if we look really closely at his underside, you can see that that last segment um, does have three small segments. Let me see if I can focus my camera while he's sitting nice and still. There we go. So we can actually see three small segments on that last piece of his abdomen. So we are extra sure um, that they um, do have the horns. If we flip him over, we can see those horns there. Um, and he's got those three body segments on his abdomen. And so this one is definitely a male and the other one is definitely a female. Um, so great observation skills, you guys. Um, so to go, oh no, there we go. Um, so um, to go back a little bit to that egg sac, um, these cockroaches do hold an egg sac inside their body, but um, they actually give live birth just like people do. Well, not just like people do, but somewhat similar. Um, so even though these cockroaches hold an egg sac inside their body, the egg sac actually hatches inside their body as well. So the egg sac will hatch inside them and then they'll give birth um, to live young. And so the nymphs actually come out fully alive. They don't lay eggs and wait for them to hatch outside their body. The egg sac, so that it's, they make sure that those nymphs are safe, um, they actually hatch inside their body. Um, so we can definitely take some more questions um, if we want to take some more questions now. There were lots of questions. Ava would like to know how do they clean themselves? Yeah, good question. Um, so the cockroaches don't clean themselves very well. They kind of rely on those mites 
those symbiotic mites to help keep them clean. Um, but cockroaches are not dirty animals by any means. They're actually very, very clean. Um, they don't live in filth. Um, they really just like to live places where they're nice and warm. Um, so they do a lot of digging, which means that they also brush up against a lot of things. Um, and that helps to keep them clean as well. But we also did say that um, they molt. And so as they're young and they get bigger and bigger, they'll actually um, molt their skin and get a whole new ex exoskeleton that emerges. And so that helps to clean them throughout their life. Um, but these ones are, he, um, are fully grown. And so he's not going to molt again. This is his final exoskeleton that he'll ever have. So how, uh, um, Evan would like to know how old they are. These guys are fully grown um, and they are about four to five years old, which is a little bit sad because that's about the maximum lifespan of these cockroaches. So um, that's very, very long for an insect. Actually, most insects actually live anywhere between a few weeks to about a year. Um, so insects don't usually live very long. Um, these cockroaches, um, let's see if I can put them in their container. Maybe they'll stay a little better. Um, they live um, up about to five years. Um, and so these ones are about at the end of their life cycle. Um, since they live in captivity, um, where we keep them nice and safe and protected, um, we might get them to live for about another year. Um, so we'll probably try to have another round of nymphs, um, our baby cockroaches, so that we have a whole new colony that we can start growing. Um, but they live about five years. Wow, that's a long time for an insect. Um, Charlotte and Isaiah would like to know, are their legs scratchy on your hands when you hold them? And why do they have, and maybe explain why they have um, hairy legs? Yeah, so they are a little bit, they kind of tickle when they crawl on you because they do have those hairs. Um, and those hairs are there for grip. And so these cockroaches can actually climb the side of this plastic container. Um, they can climb the side of their enclosure. Um, they can even climb glass. And so they're pretty tricky and those the hairs on their legs actually help them to get grip. And so they do tickle just a little bit, um, but they're not scratchy. It's not pokey or sharp. Okay, and we've got a couple questions about if they mate for life. Oh, no, these, one, these ones do not mate for life. So cockroaches are not um, like mammals or birds. Mammals and birds are um, pretty unique in the fact that they find mates and keep those mates for life. Um, insects, um, they're kind of um, migrant and so are, they migrate around a lot and so they kind of keep moving and so they don't mate for life. They might live in a colony, um, so they might live in a group of cockroaches, but they don't choose a mate. Okay, and Ava made a really good observation. I like the observations that are coming from this session. She said they are very active right now for nocturnal insects. Maybe they are. So so if you remember, I had them underneath that blanket um, before we started the program. So it kind of tricked them into thinking that it's nighttime. And so um, they're pretty active. Also, they do just like any living creature, they really enjoy stimulation. And so these hissing cockroaches, um, they do love to be stimulated. Um, so they like to be taken out for programs. Um, and by now they might or might not be aware that after they do a program like this, they get a special treat. Um, and so they might know that that treat is coming. And so they're a little bit active. Um, they do enjoy being handled. And we said that they're cold blooded. Um, so my hands are nice and warm. And so now that I've warmed them up, right, they've got lots of energy that they might not normally have. Well, um, and this is kind of interesting because um, what do the babies eat and what do they eat? And what happens to the eggs after they hatch? Do the, do the babies eat the egg back? are great questions. Um, so what do the babies eat and what do the adults eat? That is a great question. Um, now, cockroaches are decomposers. So I might answer your question with a question first. What do decomposers mainly eat? If you're familiar with decomposers as um, a class of animals or a class of organisms, what do decomposers feed on? Yes, so I see Ava said they eat garbage. Dibbler said they clean the environment. Donna said they break down dead organisms. Yeah, Gabby said the same thing, dead things, dead things, right? So they normally eat decaying organic matter or decaying organisms. Um, so not necessarily dead animals, those are organisms, um, but they eat a lot of decaying plant matter. Um, 
mushrooms, just like Ava said, are also decomposers. So they feed off of those um, decaying organic materials. And so they'll normally find um, vegetation. So if they were in the wild, they would find fallen plants or fallen fruit that falls down to the forest floor um, and they would eat that. Um, here in captivity or where we keep them as pets, um, we feed them a diet of mainly oatmeal um, so that they have protein in their diet. And then we supplement it with some treats that are things like um, fruits, like bananas and strawberries or vegetables like lettuce. And so they eat mostly plant matter, but like we said, they'll eat anything that is decaying. And so if they can't find decaying plant matter, they will eat decaying animal matter. Um, it's good for the environment, right? Because those dead organisms can still feed other living things on earth, whether it's plants or animals. Um, and if they were really desperate, right? These cockroaches um, are survivors. And so if they were really desperate, they would start to eat um, either their own young since they're really small or they might eat the eldest that are starting to die. And so um, these cockroaches are not like people, right? They don't have a lot of sentiment about them, but they will eat each other only if they have to. Awesome. Um, and then uh, Ali, Ali, Ali also noted that worms eat the leftovers to make compost. Yeah, absolutely. Worms are great. And sorry that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, worms are another great example of decomposers. Yes, they are. So they're really great. Um, every everything's in, important in the food chain. And maybe just before, um, we'll take a couple more questions, and then we'll tell you a little bit more about what's what else is coming up today because everyone's giving me information instead of asking questions, which is amazing. Are there any really cool, fun facts that you would have about these cockroaches that you haven't um, already told us? Yeah, so there's one more really fun fact. Usually it comes up in this last question section, um, but I know there's a lot of really fascinating information that we've learned, so maybe we're just not thinking of it, but we do call these cockroaches hissing cockroaches, right? But have we heard them hiss at all? Hmm. No, we haven't, right? So they haven't hissed during this program. Um, so cockroaches, just like people, um, use hissing as a form of communication. So they hiss to communicate with each other. Um, so they can do it to um, attract mates or communicate with their colony. Um, but they also hiss in order to scare away predators. Um, so things that might want to eat them, right? So um, they might hiss to scare away land animals that are trying to eat them, things like lizards. Um, they might hiss to try to scare away birds if they came swooping down and tried to eat them as food. Um, but these cockroaches haven't done a lot of hissing, and that's mainly because they're so used to being handled. Um, so these cockroaches, um, you can see this guy is cleaning himself just a little. So if you see that he's kind of wiggling down his leg there, we asked how do they clean themselves. Um, they can't reach their whole body, right? But they can kind of clean off their legs. And so that's actually what he's doing there, which is pretty cool. Um, but they do hiss um, out in the wild. Since these ones are so used to being held and they know that they might get a treat after this program, they don't hiss at me a lot. Um, and I definitely don't want to make them hiss if they don't want to. Um, so I'm not going to squeeze them because that would be one way you could get them to hiss, but that would be um, inhumane and not respectful to animals. So instead, um, I do have a um, video I can show you. So someone um, recorded a video of a hissing cockroach hissing, and it is really, really loud. Um, so I'm going to share it with you. Um, you'll have to tell me if you can hear. You should be able to hear. I think we've done this um, here before. Um, but we'll share this screen, this YouTube video, and you'll notice that this cockroach, anytime the human comes too close to it, right, this cockroach does hiss um, so that it warns the um, human um, don't eat me. And I think it's another one of those situations where you have to enable your audio before you play. It. Let's see. Yeah. I, did, I tried to look on the share screen thing. Let's see if it gives me I the, put the link for that video in the chat as well, in case people want to look at it later. Let me see if I can stop the share hear it. All right, one more thing. Settings. No. So it might 
might not. So if it's not, so Kitty did share the link and I can also, I can make sure we have the same link here. Um, so this kind of, you'll, you can watch it maybe after this program here. They do hiss pretty, pretty loud. Um, so it is a really loud sound. Um, um, so they do hiss really loud. And um, that one in the video is probably not used to being handled like our cockroaches are. Um, which is good though, because then you can make them hiss. Um, so these ones did hiss at me just a little bit earlier when I took them out of their cage. Um, but once they're out, they're pretty content with doing some exploring. And so they don't hiss a lot. Um, but the interesting thing about hissing, right, is that we said it's normally things like mammals that hiss. Um, these guys, their mouth is not quite designed like ours. So if you think about how as a human, how could you make a hissing noise, right? It has a lot to do with how you arrange your mouth. Um, so you can kind of arrange your teeth together and then push air out really, really quickly. And it makes that sound. Um, so you can definitely try that at home, but cockroaches don't have that same kind of formation in their mouth. And so they hiss in a different way. Um, so they actually don't hiss through their mouth at all. They actually have tiny little holes all over their head. So small, we can't see them unless you had a microscope, um, but they're called spiracles and they actually will push air out through their head or through those holes in their head really, really quickly, which makes that same hissing noise. And that's actually how they communicate. So as Jibbler said, they actually communicate with each other um, using different sounds of hiss. So they communicate with each other that way um, to find mates, but they also communicate to predators that way um, to warn them. I did see a question earlier about can we eat them? Um, these ones are pets and they are teaching tools. Um, so we're not gonna eat them, um, but they're actually the place we got these cockroaches from does raise them for food, um, not for people, but for pets. And so we did say that birds and lizards or even um, small snakes will eat cockroaches as a food source. They are full of protein. Um, so much more than a cricket or um, another insect might have, they've got lots of meat on their body. And so they're very, very nutritious. And so um, the animals do eat them, but also in certain parts of the world, um, humans eat them too. So that since they're full of protein in many cultures around the world, specifically in Africa and um, parts of Asia, um, cockroaches are considered a delicacy. People do like to eat them. And so you could, um, I wouldn't eat these ones um, since they're pets, but you can eat cockroaches, yes. In Africa, people do grill them. Um, and Tracy would like to know, and this is what she'd heard, can they live a couple of days without a head? Uh, yes. So um, it might not be a couple of days. It probably just depends on how healthy your cockroach is. Um, since so many of their organs, like all their vital organs, are actually contained inside their thorax and their abdomen, those lower two body segments, um, they can actually live for quite a while, at least a few hours, if their head were to be severed from their body. Um, while they're still molting, um, they can actually regrow limbs as well, kind of to an extent, not completely. So not like certain um, amphibians can, um, but as they're molting, if they were to lose small pieces of um, their legs, they would actually regrow them and they're not molt. You can see that this guy, um, as he's aging, he's um, now missing a little piece of his leg. Um, that just happens with age. Um, he's gonna be okay. Um, but he's not going to regrow a new one because he's not going to molt ever again in his life. Well, all of that is amazing information. And Anna, we're, we're going to put, sorry, we're going to put that, um, when we get our resource, um, resource section, we're going to put that on our page, the video of the hissing, as well as the resources from Michigan Science. But we, this has been phenomenal. And I think the students have been great scientists and entomologists by doing all the observations. Um, so we're really thankful that you did this and we're going to be doing kitchen science with you again next week, I believe. Um, as well, this afternoon and this morning, we do have more sessions on animals. We have bubbles and beaks at 1130 Central, 1230 Eastern, and walking up the food chain um, where you will um, see another hissing Madagascar cockroach as well as unbelievable, um, unbelievable 
insects and other animals and geology and Zumba. So we have a busy day. So thanks for joining us, everyone. We hope you come back and Anna will see you next week. And you are so brave. I don't know. Raise your hand if or put yes or no in the chat if you would like to hold a hissing Madagascar. Good question. If you said no, that's totally understandable. Um, they are they're big, but one of the pros and cons of that is they are quite large, but that makes them pretty slow. And so unlike cockroaches you might find outside, they're really, really fast and quick. Um, these guys are really big and fat and lazy. And so they move pretty slow, which makes them a little bit less intimidating to handle and pull them out for programs. So um, if you ever are in Michigan, um, if you're ever near the city of Detroit, where the Michigan Science Center is, um, come stop by. We'll let you hold one of our Madagascar hissing cockroaches. That would be great. Thank you so much. Um, that, was, that was a great session. Take care, everyone. See you later today.